Thank you. Um, thank you very much. This is cool. I've, I've wanted to get to last con and, and haven't, and here I am, and I'm, I'm enjoying today. Um, thank you. This is, if you were looking for like smart people telling you technical stuff, that's uh, later today, earlier today, and tomorrow. Um, if you're interested in old guy's view of the world, um, you know, hang on. So InfoSec history, how did we get here? Uh, this is something I've been working on for a few years and uh, dramatically revised it for, for last con. So how did we get here? Um, this is not actually the route I took. Uh, I was in Georgia and came from Jacksonville and that's not really what I mean anyway. But how did we get where we are now? Um, you know, it's a question that philosophers, scientists, and drunkards have asked since the dawn of time. Um, how did we get here? Uh, an aside, if I ever write an autobiography, uh, it will be called, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, but for some of you who may not know, and nobody should, I'm just a boring old man, how did I get here? Well, I'm a displaced auto mechanic. I, I'm not an expert in anything. The last thing I was an expert in was the big logos on the top, um, especially Renault. I was um, one of the foremost Renault technicians in the Northeast. Um, that level of masochism has served me well moving into InfoSec. Uh, you'll note other things like Saab and Peugeot and BMW and things. Uh, Cadillac during the 80s, for those of you who remember how horrible those were. Um, it was a time when GM mechanics wouldn't make fun of those of us who worked on Renaults because of what Cadillac made in the 80s. Uh, but anyway, that was it. And um, I ended up forced into automotive management. And uh, the short version, automotive management, that means they, I wasn't afraid of telephones and computers, and so I was responsible for them. Did more and more over the years until one day all I was doing was working on computers. Um, did the MCSE mill thing, got the certification treadmill, I got tired, I got leg cramps on the certification treadmill and jumped off. Discovered local user groups and local security communities, local technology communities, because they're really valuable, especially for those of us that have no budget, like everybody in security, right? We have no budget. Um, and through that, I eventually, you know, I started blogging, picked up some, uh, some consulting customers, focused more and more on security until uh, one day I made the plunge, joined Vendorland, started traveling more and more beyond uh, just the Northeast. Um, I've been on the Security Weekly, formerly Paul.com podcast for about four and a half years. We don't call it that anymore. Um, ask Paul about trademark sometime. Um, <laughs> about four and a half years ago, I joined Tenable. We're the Nessus people, and so my day job is... Um, sitting around and uh, thinking about and talking to people about vulnerability management, continuous monitoring. And actually, though, I have a pretty cool job. I get to do whatever I want. I'm, um, last year, I was on a three-person team with Marcus Random, Space Rogue, and myself. Let's just let that sink in. That means Space Rogue was the young idealist on our team. Uh, Space Rogue is in a different team now. Now it's just Marcus and I. It's a two-cranky old man. And the terrifying thing is that makes him the young one and me the idealist. Uh, so anyway, that's basically how I got here to LASCON, which is not really uh, what I meant either, but how did the industry get here? And uh, before we go on, you know, I've, I've got a confession. Um, I don't know this stuff. I have to research it. Part of the reason we teach things or give presentations on them is to force ourselves to learn things we should have known already, right? So, I mean, teaching is a fantastic way to learn stuff you thought you knew and uh, actually learn it. Uh, so don't laugh, we all are. The nature of the history of InfoSec is this. It doesn't matter if you've been in this industry for decades or if you're new and making the transition, you hit the ground running and run forward trying to keep up. And we just don't have the time to look back and see how we got here. So um, with that, this is an ongoing project. I, I owe a lot of people a lot of thanks. Uh, Becky Bass was fantastic. She is in a myriad of ways. Marcus Ranum. Uh, within the CISSP community, there's a bunch of uh, bitter old men, actually there's a couple of women, uh, known as the usual suspects. It's a private list. Uh, they were very helpful. Uh, a friend of mine created an accidental group Skype chat, which is one of the most amazing things ever. He was copying and pasting a couple dozen security friends 
from one Skype account to another, and instead of copy-paste, he launched a group chat over two years ago. It's kind of like uh, invite-only IRC in Skype, and it's whatever. Uh, SPAF was instrumental. SPAF has uh, really helped a lot. And for the web AppSec stuff, um, I know he's at, form at the F1 now, but um, our snake was a huge help. We were uh, sitting at uh, Isla, the Caribbean tiki place uh, downtown, um, and had a conversation uh, that led to me heading in this direction. This. So why do we care? Um, some of it doesn't matter, some becomes obsolete. But imagine instead of being an infosec, you were a um, kid and you got into metal. I'm looking at the age of the audience. There's some people here that are now or were metalheads. Maybe some of us that were into punk. Um, how did we get those kind of things in our lives? Well, one of the, uh, you do a little musical archaeology. And this is proto-metal. This is Link Ray, his big single. Um, and if you listen to this, it's pretty simple. This is a guy, who is, he and his brother did a, uh, he and his brother were in a country act, and he transitioned into what would become rock and roll. Um, that song, Rumble, has the distinction of being the only um, instrumental widely banned in the United States from airplay. Because it was called Rumble, and that power chord thing that was not right. Uh, uh, uh. This was uh, 1957, the year that uh, Volare be was the number one song. Uh, the number one rock song was Wooly Bully. This guy took the classic country stroll thing and uh, 53 Les Paul just started cranking what we now know as the power chord. And there's the foundation. If you listen to his stuff, it's like, oh, uh, that's the British invasion, that's some psychedelia, that is all of heavy metal, that is punk because it was a pure punk attitude. And we have this, but you can go to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and you can see these people, not him because they're idiots and haven't inducted him, but it's easy to find this. It's not always easy to find the people in our industry, especially the real founders. There are a lot of folks we do know, but some of it, especially before we get into web AppSec, things were different, right? Cyber security wasn't really a thing. Security was just part of what you did. Some people specialized in it. Um, the approaches were different. It was uh, a lot of crypto. They were trying to solve secure communications. As I mentioned before, so many people are pouring in. We can't keep up. We don't know our own stories. Uh, a lot of the older stuff uh, isn't even a 404, right? If a paper is written or a presentation is given and Google doesn't know about it, did it happen? Um, apparently not. A lot of them are military, government, and educational. Um, I think in this audience, in this location, I don't have to give the government military intelligence disclaimer that I do at some hacker cons. Um, there are a lot of really good people who are and have been through the centuries in military intelligence. And if you have problems like I do with uh, some of the excesses of NSA and GCHQ, it's not with the people in the trenches who uh, built the industry that we're in and they're still doing good stuff. Um, so, uh, but that's a, a barrier. You know, a lot of military stuff and a lot of uh, government stuff is classified or segmented, a lot of educational stuff. Higher ed, you know, it's a, it's a set of silos. And in, in our industry, we're a set of silos. So we don't uh, always know about it. A lot of them are uh, no longer active. Um, they've retired, passed away, or you know, even worse, some of them are in management. Uh, not on the con circuit, at least not our con circuit. So let's start with a few folks that we all know the names of. And I won't dwell on these, but let's uh, focus on the fact that these are not just thing technologies, these are actual people. So Diffie Hellman, I don't know. The new question is, did NSA break DH? I don't know if they did or not. You've heard of them, New Directions in Cryptography, published in 76. Um, solved some fundamental key distribution problems, key exchange problems. Big, big deal. Um, it really sparked a lot of research and a lot of advancements in crypto. Was it Sun Forever? 
Uh, he is a huge advocate and has been since the beginning about individual rights and privacy. Uh, Marty, people don't hear as much about him. Physical security too, he was an early advocate of the Beyond War movement. He's a, uh, he has been worried about the, the specter of nuclear war and misuse of nuclear weapons uh, since the 70s. He's an actual person with real beliefs and things. It's kind of cool. The third member that often gets cut out, as I did in the first one, is Ralph Merkel. A lot of people, unless you're in crypto, you don't know Ralph Merkel. Uh, computer scientist, one of the inventors of public key cryptography, uh, invented cryptographic hashing, uh, has been a researcher on molecular nanotechnology and cryonics. Um, he basically created a, a a rudimentary version of what we now know as Diffie-Hellman as a college project. He's kind of a bright dude. Um, and he often gets overlooked because he wasn't part of the Diffie-Hellman. Uh, these guys, maybe you know the names, maybe you don't. Ron West, if you, if you don't know who they are, there's a little subtle hint. Um, again, these are actual people. Uh, they have some interesting interests. If I can figure out how to get my notes to be legible in my elderly eyes. Uh, so Ron, everybody knows, created all sorts of symmetric key algorithms, authored uh, the uh, message digests. Um, he created the three ballot system voting system, a paper ballot system designed to allow you to prove that your vote was counted and basically a, non a paper non-repudiation for voting. Why did you do it in paper? Ron Rivest doesn't think, thinks that um, the electoral process is too important to trust to computers. Ron Rebess says, uh, <laughs> it is too, Im our democracy is too important. <laughs> uh, and of course he placed it in the public domain. Uh, Adi is uh, one of the inventors, inventors of uh, differential cryptanalysis. And uh, Lynn, besides his theoretical computer science and crypto is into DNA computing. He's looking at using biologics instead of silicone for, for computing. They didn't stop. You know, these guys are still out there. And you run into these folks at RSA and other conferences, crypto conferences. Um, they're not as active as they used to be. But you probably don't know, even if you're a cryptographer, you may not know uh, James Ellis, Jim Ellis, Clifford Cox, and Malcolm Williamson. Um, I hit it twice. There we go. 1970, at GCHQ, Ellis was working on secure communications. And he wrote a paper, didn't actually develop it, but he wrote a paper on what he called non-secret encryption in 1970, which was uh, instrumental in future advances in cryptography for GCHQ. For those of you who know, GCHQ is the UK's version of NSA, if you will. Um, he wrote it, defined it, what it would need to do, what it would need to look like, how it would need to function, what it could and couldn't do. He wrote it in 1970. Uh, we now call this public key cryptography, which we started to see in 75 and 76 in the public. Um, in 1973, uh, Clifford Cox joined GCHQ. They didn't know what to do with him, new mathematician fresh out of school. They handed him um, Ellis's paper, said, here, read this. <coughs> and he worked out a lot of the symmetric side of things. Um, including some critical algorithms uh, five years or uh, three years later dis discovered by Rebess, Shamir, and Oldman. He created RSA before RSA. College buddy of his, Malcolm Williamson, very shortly afterwards joins. We don't know what to do with Malcolm. Give him that paper that Jim wrote. Um, those of you who are psychic or can see a pattern working, yes, he invented Diffie-Hellman before Diffie-Hellman. 74, he, and he, he perfected what we now know as Diffie-Hellman. Now, it was GCHQ. They didn't get much value out of it. They didn't use it much. They didn't do anything with it. Um, and none of this was declassified until 1997. Uh, Ellis was uh, long dead by then. But the others are still alive. Uh, Clifford Cox actually is one of the inventors of identity-based crypto and was uh, eventually chief mathematician at GCHQ, which is kind of a big deal. Um, but anyway, this is a classic case of why I talk about government military folks, you know, and it's one of the things that when we discover things, when you find something, you're like, wow, I found something. And the people I really like are like, why did it take me so long? And then you Google to see if somebody else did. 
instead of having an ego to think that you've created. But just because somebody else got there doesn't mean you can't take it further. Just remember there are other people who have been doing this. Um, five folks that I will list. Um, this is not a plug for bug, bug crowd, but we can't not start with Grace Hopper. If you don't know Grace Hopper's stories, they're phenomenal. Uh, she was an amazing woman. Um, the reason bug crowd has adopted her is because the term debugging comes from Grace Hopper. Mechanical switches, mechanical relay. She took a moth out of a relay to debug the operation of a system, and thus we have debugging. Um, if you want a really quick introduction to how awesome she was, uh, go to YouTube, find the, the interview with David Letterman. It's, it's phenomenal. Her, her, her shtick was she carried pieces of wire. It's like, would you like a nanosecond? Here's a nanosecond. It, and it was, it was trying to explain why satellite communications took so long. Why does it take them? This is how fast light can run, the radio wave can go. And uh, she was just awesome. Anyway, uh, Becky Bass is somebody who's still alive and active. She's teaching now. Becky Bass, a lot of people don't know, and people like me that are in the network security side, all the people that we work for, not all, the founders of the network security side, particularly IDS, all owe something to Becky. In many cases, they owe everything. She was in NSA. She drove that network analysis stuff. People like Marty Resch, Ron Gula, Marcus Ranham, um, John Flowers, and others all got a lot of advancement out of that. And so this was used by military and intelligence communities internally to detect bad things, but it created a huge chunk of our industry. Um, one of the Becky stories that I love is that she's a Southern Alabama girl. And she moved north and married a Yankee and went to work for the government in DC. And before she left, um, her dad said, you know, when you're done doing all that, um, come home. We, we need people like you here in Alabama. And so some years ago, no, five years ago, I don't remember exactly, uh, she realized she was done and it was time to slow down. So she did what she promised. She's at the University of Southern Alabama teaching kids that otherwise wouldn't have access to one of the uh, foundational brains in our industry. Uh, Bob Abbott is somebody that not enough people know. He wrote the uh, first set of privacy and data confidentiality policies for healthcare. He's arguably the first person to make a career outside of government out of security. He left government service and started being a consultant and actually did it. Um, a couple of things, he wrote um, monitoring systems for open heart surgery patients. One thing that I will take a couple seconds to read, he was uh, fundamental in the RESOS survey, um, research into secure operating systems. Uh, 71 to 76, and they defined, this is at the OS level, but tell me if any of these ring true as uh, application security folks. He defined uh, seven fundamental uh, issues in operating system security. And I, the good news is that decades later, these are solved problems, right? Uh, one, incomplete parameter validation. Two, inconsistent parameter validation. Three, implicit sharing of privilege or confidential data. Four, asynchronous validation and inadequate serialization. So race conditions, time to check out, time to use. Um, inadequate identification, authentication, authorization. <laughs> um, <laughs> viable uh, prohibitions and limits. Uh, we, we tell the program you can't do that, and it, we, but we don't actually write it that way. And then... Um, <laughs> our favorite, exploitable logic errors. Um, <laughs> I would like to say, you know, the good news is we've got those out of our operating systems. And we're making progress there. Um, <laughs> um, and in the movie Sneakers, for those that have seen the movie, I hope you all, at, uh, there was the NSA dude, the James Earl Jones character was named uh, Bernard Abbott was actually named for Bob Abbott. Bob Abbott was technical advisor, and the team that was in the movie, all of the people on that team were based on characters in the first red team at NSA, which was led by Bob uh, Abbott. So 
cool dude. Jim Anderson's another one. Um, everything from, um, he created the, uh, the idea and implemented the first reference monitor in 1972. Uh, audit trail based intrusion detection in 80. I was a contributor to the WEAR report. We'll talk about that in a minute. Follow on report, the uh, Anderson report. So anybody in Air Force, Air Force security policy still has hooks back to um, the Anderson report. Uh, he was involved in Orange Book and other Rainbow series. He was a uh, univac to, to Burroughs and beyond. Um, when he passed away, staff wrote a, an obituary um, tribute to him. Anderson had broad interests, deep concerns, great insight, and a rare willingness to operate out of the spotlight. His sense of humor and patience with those earnestly seeking knowledge were greatly admired, as were his candid responses to the clueless and self-important. That's, that's a good model, right? You're really trying to learn? I'm going to take some time with you. You're impressed with yourself? I'm not. Um, <laughs> So sometimes in the darkness, there's a light, and we wonder if it's a light at the end of the tunnel, if the train's coming to run us over. You know, it's, it's not almost the end of the year. We're going to start getting the end-of-year predictions, right? Yay, everybody, you know. The trade press is going to become more boring than usual. Um, if somebody made the prediction, the computer will touch men everywhere and in every way, almost on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. Every man will communicate through a computer whatever he does. It will change and reshape his life, modify his career, and force him to accept a life of continuous change. There are people that don't believe that today. Ten years ago, there are a lot more people that wouldn't believe that. Willis Ware told us this in 1966. There are only a handful of us in the room who were alive then. Willis Ware told us, this shit matters. He was a little classier than that. Um, worked on classified radar systems, did uh, identify friend or foe stuff during World War II, was at Rand for 40 years, 52 to uh, retirement in 92. Where report was issued in 1967, its fundamental value is not diminished uh, in the intervening years. Um, decades before it was a popular concern, he was worried about the reliance on computers preventing seri pre presenting serious privacy issues. Uh, our first uh, Data Protection Act signed by Ford in 74 um, was the direct result of him in 66 seeing what was coming down the road working from then forward to protect our privacy. I would like to say that government has not changed direction there. Uh, and actually, we just lost him uh, in the past, just over a year ago at age 93. So let's move into some of the newer folks. And we'll go through this. We don't need to dwell on this. But here's um, cool stuff. These folks are around. Some of them were here at last time. Um, so unlike the deceased and checked out and even worse management of old stuff, there are folks that you can talk to. This is how we got here. Um, these are mostly in chronological order. Don't argue with me on it. I don't know. They're, they're somewhat randomized. Um, and they're, I'm not going to really dwell on these too much because you should know who these people are, but let's, let's bring it up. So uh, Elkham Tough, variety of overlay attacks, the, the passive sniffer for uh, OS identification, POF, Browser hacking handbook, all sorts of things. He's, a, he's currently at Google. Um, he describes himself as a highly decorated solutions synergy ideation professional. <laughs> His personal blog has some uh, interesting insights on a, a Polish native now in the US, on uh, Poland and the US, and difference in culture between Eastern Europe. Um, so he is not just terrifyingly brilliant guy. Um, he's insightful as well. So uh, that's, that's him. Uh, this dude, I'm assuming most of you know him. He's been around a while. Um, he still has his boyish good looks. Um, intranet port scanning, fierce scanner, slow loris, click jacking, you know, the hackers.org. I uh, spoke this morning. He's at White Hat now. But he's one of the foundational figures. He's right here. I mean, he's, he's hanging out with us, right? And he, he's also, I was, I was put off. He and Matt Jay gave a talk this morning. Um, it, 
it was not near as terrifying. Because normally when I go to arsenic stocks, I'm like, ah, I'm turning off my phone, I'm done. I'm just, done. No more. <laughs> um, uh, so he was actually kind of hopeful and like making tools to help make things better. Um, uh, so when I was researching all the old folks, it was tough to find information. And I would like, I'd pester Marcus and say, who do you know? And I'd like, ask Spaff. And I'd, do you, do you have any? And Google would find a few things, and nobody would know anything, and I couldn't find pictures. You folks are all on Twitter. I am too, but everybody's on Twitter. Um, I always try to credit photos. Nobody credits their own Twitter avatars, but boy, it's a lot easier to get most of these folks. Um, <clears throat> and again, that's kind of because they're alive and active, uh, which we should take advantage of. David Ross, cross-site scripting, Windows zones, X-Frame options, things like that. Um, you know, David was at Microsoft. He's now at Google. He's another one of the people that you know got us where we are. Um, it was years before he wanted these two names linked publicly. Um, uh, for those of us in the the hacker community, um, Reinforced Puppy is. Uh, known for ending the disclosure drama decade plus ago with uh, RF policy. Maybe not quite ending it as it's still blowing up today, but RF policy was significant and still is a good starting point for any conversation uh, for disclosure. But null byte injection, SQL injection, um, things like that. He's CTO at uh, Blue Box now. Uh, he is another foundational figure who's still active, David Litchfield. Um, I have it in good authority that Marianne Davidson sends him Christmas cards, even though she's left Oracle now. Um, he kind of knows databases and kind of knows how to break them, right? Um, to put it mildly. And he's pretty buff, too. Um, and uh, he also likes to play with sharks. Um, he likes to get in a cage and be thrown overboard with apex predators in the water. Um, in spite of that, he is a pretty sharp dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mark Curfee. Uh, OWASP, yeah, that's, that's kind of significant, OWASP. Um, I, I like uh, Mark because we're getting close to somebody who's almost my age, uh, as opposed to the rest of these children. Uh, but you know, these people are still active. Amit Klein, I, you know, I can't even give you a laundry, there's a laundry list of what Klein did for us. Uh, Things like header injection and response splitting and DNS cache poisoning and in-session phishing. He's a trustier now, but he's you know another one of the foundational figures that's still around and still with us. Uh, Bob Auger is here. Um, you will note that there's no picture there. Um, there are some pictures of him around, but he's made an effort. You know his, his Twitter avatar and LinkedIn and most places you find him, there are no photos. So I figure he doesn't want to be advertised anymore. So that's cool. That's you know. Most of us are a little more public than we should be and rationalize it one way or another. Um, CGISecurity.com, Web Application Security Consortium. Uh, he's speaking tomorrow at 10 a.m., I believe. He's at Box. Um, you know, he's still active. This dude we all know, right? Uh, Jeremiah. Um, we, we know not to pick a fight with him. Um, Black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu. He likes Australian rules football, which to me is an oxymoron because I didn't think there actually were rules in Australian rules football. Um, likes to hack video games still. He's still got that going. And then, of course, like the computer-y stuff, click jacking and everything else that he's done. And uh, you know, he also, um, right, he still lives in paradise, but he's still back in Hawaii. Uh, wow, that's okay. This guy, Weld Pond. We had to get somebody from the loft in here. Um, loft crack, net crack, binary analysis, um, testifying before Congress using an alias when loft did. They're uh, some of the few people that have ever testified before Congress not using real names. Um, it was actually a semi official uh, testifying because of they didn't. Uh, they have some great stories about that. I won't steal them, but uh, if you ever get to hear the stories about driving the rented van to Washington, D.C. from Boston. Um, yeah, it was a good time. Uh, so anyway, this guy, Jeff Williams, he'll be here tomorrow uh, at 10. Um, you know, he's why we have a top 10. That's where WebGoat came from, the SAPI. These people are still around um, 
still active and um, are often eager to talk. Herp sweet. Uh, I'm a network guy and I still like herp sweet. Yes, right. Uh, this doesn't work right. Let's screw with things. Oh, look, if I do this, then I don't have to pay for the wire. Uh, no, I mean, I wouldn't do that. I have heard that um, there, there are uh, creative uses. Uh, but Port Swigger, he was actually just interviewed a couple of weeks ago uh, on the Security Weekly podcast. Um, that was a pre-recorded interview. I wasn't on that one. But, um, that was... No script, flash got, academics, uh, Giorgio. Um, that Giorgio is the one with the glasses, by the way. He's, uh, uh, PDP. Uh, new citizen, router hacking. You know, these things that we take for granted, they're just part of what we do every day when we're, we're trying to secure applications. This is what it's built on. Uh, Ivan, SSL Labs, mod security stuff. You know, he's done amazing things on that defensive side, uh, figuring out ways to test things, figuring out ways to uh, secure things. Uh, Dr. John's, uh, Martin John's request rodeo, DNS rebinding. Still, he's not even 30. <laughs> so yeah, the, the worm, um, session prediction, PHP session prediction and other things. One of the, the really cool things about Sammy, he's a cool dude, uh, he didn't mean to destroy Facebook. Um, he, for those that don't know, he was charged and convicted, um, but Facebook didn't press charges. That was DA that, that made that decision. Uh, and he loves teaching people. He's got a YouTube channel that is packed full of stuff, and he's always working on stuff, and he shares any of it that's worth sharing. Uh, just cool. We interviewed him a couple of months ago. Um, it was good. Uh, Dot Mario, uh, he likes to screw with people trying to put his name in wikis. Um, <laughs> Uh, PHP IDS, HTML5 security, things like that are, um, are what we think of when we think of him, what he's given us, and a lot of other people. So there's some resources I've used. Um, the Babbage Institute, University of Minnesota, has some great resources. They have a lot of oral histories. Uh, not much, actually, to the best of my knowledge, yes, this is resizing weirdly, but I, so that's why I have simple slides, because... I could try to be artistic, and I suck at that, so I just won't. Um, not a lot of web appsec folk, but foundational people. They have a ton of information, uh, but it's kind of a .edu. Uh, Wikipedia, usual disclaimers apply. It is entirely possible you'll find the truth at Wikipedia someday. Um, if you're into the podcast thing, there are three podcasts who've talked to a lot of people in the industry through the years. Uh, Gary McGraw's Silver Bullet podcast has done a lot of those foundational figures that are still active. Um, Paul Security Weekly, no longer called that other thing. Um, we've had a handful on uh, Risky Business. Uh, Pat Gray's uh, podcast out of Australia has had a handful of folks on. Uh, very good stuff. And so I mentioned that this was a project. So this dude, he sort of changed the way we look at the world forever, um, is misquoted as saying, if I've seen further, it's by standing on the shoulders of giants. That's Newton. He changed the way we look at the world forever. Right? That's actually a line that he repeated that someone had, that he had learned from, had said, which makes that actually more powerful. Guy changed, literally changed the way we look at the world. And there are people trying to uh, take us beyond Newtonian physics, right? There are people trying to disprove Newtonian physics. They have that giant underground donut out there in CERN or whatever, right? Who, th who do you suppose hopes that Newtonian physics work more than somebody standing next to that metal tube and staring at a bolt and saying, you know, I hope torsion and friction and shit really work because there's stuff flying around in here. I want to stay in there. Um, so, yeah, I want to disprove him, but not right now. Uh, let me get to the control room. Thus was born uh, a really... Sad little wiki, uh, but I am adding to it. A couple other folks are contributing. Shoulders of InfoSec Project, shouldersofinfosec.org. Um, I discovered about 10 minutes before I started that 
I still have yet to master Gandhi's DNS. But uh, if you go to shouldersofinfosec.org, you'll get there. Some of the other URLs kind of get weird. Uh, but that's a blog and wiki. lists all the people in today's presentation, a few notes and relevant links. It's a work in progress. Um, we're not quite done. I'll put that up. But you guys know how to use the internet. I'm easy to find. Um, I blog. Uh, not. I, I'm very kind to my blog readers because I write very, very little, so I don't tax you much. Uh, Travelingcurmudgeon.blogspot.com is where I. Uh, that's allegedly my travel blog. That is. Jack, that's where Jack gets drunk uh, on at cons, and also has an introductory uh, home bartending series that needs to resume. Um, so anyway, shoulders of infosec. This uh, last night I added a page off of the main page that lists these and other uh, web appsec folks. Main page has mostly older uh, folks. There's also a page, thanks to one of my coworkers, uh, who's been in the antivirus and anti-malware biz for a long time, a page of antivirus uh, founders. Um, Davi Ottenheimer has helped considerably in adding a lot of the hacker history. And so it's just a work in progress. And I'm not trying to compete with Babbage. I try to link to them, I try to find, but it's just a way to find people that got us where we are today. And maybe it's to thank them, maybe it's to blame them, but you know, it's, it's a reference. And it's just a handful of links to, you know, you click on there, you go to the page, it's, you know, with this crowd, it lists their Twitter and their LinkedIn and things like that. Um, unfortunately for a lot of the older ones, it lists uh, obituaries, tributes, and other things like that. If you have anybody that you think belongs in this, in any category, um, if you have too much time on your hands and want to screw with a really horrible wiki, um, it's it's on PB Works for anybody who knows PB Works. We uh, put we put security B sides on there to, to make it happen really quickly six and a half years ago, and now we have too much data to ever move again. And it's a non-standard wiki, and it's something I refer to as software Stockholm syndrome. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but it's the one I know, so it's there. Uh, so, you know, with that, we've got a, a few minutes. I'll take questions, comments, if you want. Um, anybody have anybody that's missing? Comments, jeers? If you want, like, reach out to me any way you can find me at Shoulders. There's a link or whatever if there are people that need to be on there. Um, if anybody doesn't want to be on there that's on there, I haven't had this yet, but I haven't had a lot of current active people. Happy to, you know, tear it right down. Um, so it's uh, pretty straightforward, and it's how we got there. And with that, I do have a couple of closing comments. Um, this has come up a few times, and it's worth, worth reflecting on. Why is it called the shoulders of InfoSec instead of the giants of InfoSec? We don't, we don't need to celebrate giants, particularly giant egos. Um, what makes a difference are, is that that shoulder that we move forward, our knowledge base grows. It's called shoulders of InfoSec because offering a shoulder is what's important. Um, every one of us can offer a shoulder to someone who needs it to help them move forward and we all move forward. As a matter of fact, I would argue that offering shoulders is what makes us giants. 